Welcome to today's uh, aerospace engineering brown bag uh, lunch uh, seminar. Uh, without the lunch or bring your own lunch. Um, I hope everyone's having a, a, a good July here and a, and a good summer overall. Uh, we have uh, two good talks here today that we're, we're happy to hear from on um, so very different topics. It's, it's great to see, um, you know, the diversity of, of research that's been done here. Um, by our students. Um, so I'll introduce each of the speakers um, and at, at the end of the talk you will be able to um, put a question in the chat or you can put it in the Q&A uh, and then we can engage that way. So thank you for joining. Uh, the first talk will be given by um, Adrian Dorr. Uh, Adrian's advisor is uh, Professor Fai. Um, and her topic is Improving Human Interaction in the Rotorcraft Simulation Lab. So without further ado, Adrian. Okay, cool. Okay, hi, um, my name is Adrian Dorr. I work under Dr. Fine in the Rotorcraft Simulation Lab, and today I'll be discussing improving human interactions in the simulator. Um, so to get started, I'll give you a little overview of my presentation. So the Rotocraft Simulation Lab on campus focuses primarily in, on pilot-in-the-loop testing, which allows for rapid evaluation of various control systems and provides a stress-free environment for pilots to conduct potentially hazardous testing. One of the more difficult procedures performed by a Rotocraft is shipboard landing due to the high levels of pilot workload associated with the complex operation. Um, and the current simulator queuing system lacks some key sensory factors such as sounds, vibrations, and visual details, which could significantly enhance the accuracy of the data recorded. So Microsoft Flight Simulation Software and associated modeling-based programs were evaluated in an effort to improve the visual details. And additionally, testing was conducted with the current simulation software, Unigen, to introduce sounds and vibrations into the simulator. My presentation will discuss several of the difficulties in providing an accurate simulation environment and steps that can be taken to improve the human factors aspect of the Rotocraft Simulation Lab. Um, so the, currently, the shipboard landing project, as I mentioned, is the main focus of the simulator. Pictured here is the current setup of the queuing system used for the shipboard landing. The idea is the hoops act as a judgment point to give pilots a direction to aim for when attempting to land on the ship deck. However, as previously mentioned, some of the key sensory aspects are missing. Um, and unless you are very familiar with the, with the simulator, it's difficult to make accurate judgments when it comes to landing speed and force. Therefore, the overarching goal of my research was to improve queuing systems visually, physically, and audibly. So the first project that I set out to research was the improvement of the simulator visuals. With the introduction of the new Microsoft Flight Simulator simulation software, it was decided that an update to the current software was needed. The Microsoft Flight Simulator includes more photorealistic visuals and has faster load times compared to the current software, making an ideal upgrade. With the simulation software established, the next, next task was to determine how to actually build the simulation environment. In order to build the queuing system, the simulator requires a file in the format known as a graphics language transmission file. And the two main programs that can produce these files are 3ds Max and Blender. So there are several important factors to consider when determining which program to use, um, including the steps to build queue shapes, how to assign materials to the shapes, the simplicity of exporting files in the correct format, and the difficulty of reducing polygons in the programs in order to op optimize them for real-time application. With no previous experience in either of the programs, the first step was to familiarize myself with each of the modeling softwares. Um, both of the programs are considered more of an animation software and vary slightly from the common engineering programs such as AutoCAD, SolidWorks, and CATIA. So I used LinkedIn Learning as well as some YouTube videos um, to become accustomed to the programs and learn some basic building tools. In addition, um, I read the official forums for the Microsoft Flight Simulation, software has looked at various tutorials um, to understand what to expect from the new software. After watching several tutorials, it was observed that the software began to lag as the surroundings became more complex. Um, and this observation led to the conclusion that reducing the number of polygons in the workflow was a critical part of optimizing the, the performance of the software. So after researching the two programs, it was determined that 3DX Max was the better option to use as the modeling system in the Rotocraft simulator. 
Blender is, well, both programs are an animation software. Um, 3ds Max is geared more towards architecture and was therefore found to be a little more user friendly. Also, since 3ds Max is an Autodesk program, its graphics and home screens are comparable to programs such as AutoCAD and Inventor, making it a little easier to pick up. Additionally, the procedures for learning how to build the shapes and assign materials and reduce the number of polygons was straightforward, making it the preferred choice. Um, while 3ds Max uh, does not directly convert the files to the correct format, an additional exporter can easily be added to the program in order to achieve this. Also, the Rotocraft Simulation Lab has access to the 3ds Max through the school license, um, which would make it easy implementation and the ideal choice to construct the queuing system. Um, the next step to improving the human experience of the simulator is integrating audio and vibrations into the current environment. Audio and physical cues are a huge indicator to rely on in order to gauge the conditions when flying. A change in sound to a pilot could indicate that they're moving too fast, that there's a change in wind, um, and vibrations can provide the pilot with important feedback on their landing. There's also a phenomenon known as shutter where the helicopter begins to vibrate very close to landing. This condition could be potentially dangerous and understanding when and where it occurs could prove vital in the future. The first aspect I researched was implementing audio into the simulator. The Rotocraft um, lab had previously purchased a large set of professional Black Hawk recordings. However, currently none of them were being used. Um, as previously mentioned, the program that will be used is Unigen, and within this program, you can either add ambient sounds or source sounds. Essentially, you could have either a constant audio or sounds that are linked to specific objects that change based upon your location in the simulator. So in preparation for using the software, I watched multiple tutorials and read through the, the Unigen discussion board to learn about all the different uses. So the path forward as of now um, for implementing the audio is to first add audio in relation to the queuing system as a starting point, um, such as adding landing sounds near the shipboard deck or linking sounds to the specific hoops in the queuing system, where the next step would be to use C++ in order to play the recordings at a specific time or link them to a specific action. However, at this time, additional research into Unigen is required for this. Okay, so the other part of the simulator that is very underused is a tactile transducer, which is currently installed under the seats in the simulator. The transducer has a low frequency and can be used to introduce vibrations in the simulation environment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's no feedback based upon the touchdown speed or force. So typically, um, when pilots are landing, they're coming in too fast, um, but they're not getting any feedback, so there's no change on the next approach. So two important factors to consider with this addition of vibrations are when does shutter occur and how will the amplitudes of the vibration change at different touchdown speeds? I've been reading the FAA Pilots Operating Handbook to gain a sense of when shutter occurs, but this is proving slightly more difficult than expected as shutter is a common word used amongst pilots, but in research sense, it's often linked to accidents when, when, when other helicopters have crashed. So there's little written on this phenomenon in regards to landing and therefore has been marked as a point for further research. Um, so moving forward, my next steps will be to sort through the audio files to determine which are necessary and begin the process of integrating both audio and vibrations based upon the queuing system with the ultimate goal of coding the audio and vibrations to correlate to specific airspeed and touchdowns forces. Um, so to conclude, throughout this presentation, I've discussed several of the difficulties in providing an accurate simulation environment, um, as well as the steps that can be taken to improve the human factors aspects of the simulator. It should be noted that, unfortunately, at this time, Microsoft Flight Simulator has not been installed, and it may be a while before the program is ready to be used in a university setting, because as of now, it's geared more towards the gaming industry. But when the Microsoft Flight Simulator is ready to be installed, the research has already been done and then to understand the necessary steps needed to, to be taken to implement the software. Um, however, the implementation of audio and physical aspects of the simulator is still on track and has a clear direction to move forward. The addition of sounds and vibrations will not only help the pilots fly in the simulator, but it will also significantly improve the accuracy of the data recorded. Human factors can be one of the most challenging aspects of creating a simulation environment, um, but as we strive to advance the capabilities of a rotocraft simulator, a more accurate environment will continue to develop. Um, so that concludes my presentation, and at this time I'll take any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, yeah, very great. Um, 
So yeah, we're open for questions now. You can put those um, in the chat um, or in the Q&A. So let's see what questions you have. Adrian, while we're waiting for any, I um, do want to ask you, so you, you mentioned you're finishing up your co-op. What's next for you after uh, you finish your, your bachelor's? Yeah, so um, I was recently awarded the SMART Scholarship through the Department of Defense. Um, so they're going to pay for my master's, and then in return, um, I'm going to go and work at Eglin Air Force Base as part of the Air Force Research Lab in their munitions directory. Awesome. Oh, great. Um, so, Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Congratulations. So well, thank you very much, uh, Adrian. Um, and uh, if, if there are any other questions that come up, please do please do just put those in the chat. That won't interrupt uh, the next talk. But let's go on to the next talk. Um, so and that is to be done uh, by Paul Carter. Uh, Paul's advisor is uh, Dr. Glenn Lightsey. Um, um, so happy to hear his talk on uh, GPS receiver module acceptance testing for the GT2 CubeSat mission. So, uh, Paul, take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Paul Carter. I'm a student in Dr. Lightsey's lab, and my brown bag presentation will be on the topic of GPS receiver module acceptance testing for the GT2 CubeSat mission. So first, a little bit of background on myself and my research experience. Um, I joined Dr. Lightsey's lab in SSDL as an undergraduate researcher in spring 2020. Um, I spent that first semester working in the Mission Control Center on the Mission Ops team. Um, at the time, the Mission Control Center was in its infant stage, and we were working on building up the infrastructure needed for it to support future spacecraft missions developed in the lab. Um, I spent that semester using SDK to develop displays and visualizations for the Mission Control Center monitors. Um, I'm not going to be going into detail about any of that work um, because it's not directly related to the GPS receiver testing. However, that semester was definitely quite valuable in giving me my first exposure to spacecraft missions. Um, that semester's work was also unfortunately interrupted by COVID, um, but I was lucky to be able to come back to the lab in a new role in fall 2020 as part of the GT1 avionics team. Um, so that semester, I started training to learn the workings of GPS, the use of GPS for satellite navigation, and how to operate the lab's GPS constellation simulator. Um, so I'll be covering those topics and that work in the first half of the presentation. Um, so originally, the GPS receiver was planned to be tested during the fall 2020 semester and flown on GT1. Uh, unfortunately, um, it was having power issues, and we had to send it back to the manufacturer for repair and descope it from the GT1 mission. Um, thus, in spring 2021, uh, the repaired receiver was sent back to the lab, and I was able to complete acceptance testing um, so that it could be flown on the GT2 mission. Um, the acceptance testing procedures and the results will be discussed in the second half of the presentation. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about the workings of GPS, uh, just to provide some context for how and why uh, we want to use GPS on our mission and also to help explain uh, how the Constellation Simulator works because that was an essential piece of testing the receiver module. Um, so GPS, as we all likely know, uh, stands for Global Positioning System. It's a pretty much ubiquitous component of our modern lives and most of us are use, using it daily. Uh, but what some of us may not know or at least maybe don't think about very often is how GPS works and how it is useful for satellites, including CubeSats. Um, so GPS is itself a constellation of satellites in a medium Earth orbit that are continuously broadcasting navigation messages down towards Earth. Um, the constellation is set up such that an Earth-based GPS receiver receives a navigation message from at least four satellites at all times. Um, so coded in that navigation message is information about the time of transmission and the position of the satellite that sent the message. Um, that's known as as the pseudo-random code. Um, using the information in this code, along with the receiver's own copy of the pseudo-random noise code uh, and a clock, the receiver can determine how long it took for the signal to reach it and thus determine its distance from that particular satellite, aka the pseudo-range. Um, so performing that pseudo-range calculation for three different satellites 
at known locations um, gives enough information to calculate a position in 3D space. However, uh, the errors of calculation involving only three satellites are very high um, because there's a non-negligible clock offset term that has to be solved for. Thus, a fourth satellite is required to calculate a that receiver clock offset and make an accurate position fix. Um, so this positioning technique is known as pseudorange multilateration, and it's really at the heart of how GPS works. Um, so satellites in low Earth orbit enjoy effectively the same constant coverage of at least a minimum of four satellites that Earth-based users do, uh, because there's not much difference between the altitude of an Earth-based user and a LEO user at the scale of a medium Earth orbit. Um, thus, a GPS receiver is just as effective at positioning your phone on the Earth as it is a CubeSat in low Earth orbit. Um, with just a few modifications for, you know, orbital speed, which we can talk about in a minute. So um, I spent that time discussing how GPS functions uh, as a constellation of satellites, mostly so that you'll have a better understanding of the GNSS constellation simulator that I'm about to discuss, because that was pretty much the most important and interesting piece of equipment involved in testing the receiver. Um, so GNSS stands for Global Navigation Satellite System. Uh, it's a generic term, and GPS is just one example of such a system. Uh, the particular GNSS simulator we have in Dr. Lightsey's lab is called the NAVX NCS. Um, although it kind of looks like an unassuming small gray box, it is one of the most expensive and powerful pieces of equipment in the whole lab. Um, it's capable of robustly simulating several different GNSS constellations, including uh, novel ones created by a user. Um, however, for the receiver module testing purposes, uh, that I did. I only really used its GPS simulating capability, so I'll pretty much just refer to it as simply the GPS simulator. Um, so what does it mean to simulate a, a GPS constellation? Um, well, we know that each satellite is broadcasting a message consisting of its own pseudorandom noise code at all times, and that depending on the velocity of the receiver um, relative to the satellite, that signal experiences some Doppler shift. Um, Additionally, depending on uh, the relative position of the receiver, um, the signal is affected by the medium it's passing through, with the most notable effects uh, being caused by the ionosphere. Um, and on top of the frequency shift and the ionospheric time delays, um, we also have the signal power attenuating as it travels through the vacuum of space and through the atmosphere. Um, so all of those factors, uh, plus other small perturbing factors, uh, basically come together to uh, determine the exact power frequency and phase of um, each signal that a receiver, which is traveling at a given velocity and at a specific position, uh, will pick up from each satellite at a given point in time. Um, so when you give the, the simulator um, a receiver's initial state, um, the simulator is able to calculate the nature of that GPS signal um, that the receiver would receive uh, with all the Doppler shifts, attenuations, and atmospheric delays accurately represented. Um, and then it is also not able, not only able to like calculate that signal, but it's also able to generate that exact RF signal and feed it into a receiver over a wired connection. So uh, using the simulator, a user in a lab can replicate nearly exactly the RF environment that a receiver would see while it is orbiting in its mission's orbit at you know any given uh, epoch and see how the receiver responds. Um, effectively, the receiver can think it is traveling at orbital speeds and altitudes at any time in the future, um, all while sitting safely on a lab test bench. And uh, that's pretty much the magic of the Constellation Simulator um, for testing purposes. So we've, uh, we know how a spacecraft is able to utilize um, GPS receiver for positioning. So let's talk about why a spacecraft would want to fly with a GPS receiver. Um, so depending on the spacecraft's mission, a GPS receiver may be unnecessary or totally essential. 
Um, a receiver isn't necessarily required for communication with the satellite because uh, ground operators can typically track um, a satellite using ground tracking methods. Um, however, there's many cases where it's important for the satellite to have instantaneous knowledge of its position independent of any communication from a ground operator. Um, so a satellite with various operational modes along its orbit would need to understand its orbit and position at all times, um, which is easily done by a GPS receiver. Um, the position and velocity knowledge um, that comes from a GPS receiver can also be used for the planning of maneuvers, um, which is really important for formation flying missions. Um, additionally, the operation of certain instruments and payloads carried by the spacecraft may require uh, position knowledge um, for purposes such as instrument pointing or position tagging uh, the data they collect. Um, and GPS receivers can even be used for attitude determination using some special GPS-based um, attitude determination algorithms. Um, and obviously everyone kind of knows GPS for its role in positioning, uh, but GPS is also a very valuable timing tool um, because the process of positioning with radio navigation, it necessarily involves extremely precise clocks. Um, thus, the signals received by GPS receivers can be used not only for position knowledge, but um, also for timing knowledge. And the spacecraft can use it to synchronize its own subsystems or synchronize uh, between multiple spacecrafts in a formation. Um, so now we kind of know why a satellite would want to fly with the GPS receiver. So let's take a look at the goals of GT2 and why we are putting GPS receiver on our mission. So uh, GT2 is a 1U CubeSat that's currently being developed by an undergraduate team in SSDL. Um, the goal of the mission is to improve on the design of its predecessor, GT1, and provide more capability to upcoming GT3 and GT4 missions. Um, in particular, with GT2, we want to increase the ease of assembly and testing, improve the reliability, and improve the performance compared to GT1. Um, so one key performance improvement is going to be the addition of the GPS receiver. Um, as I said earlier, the receiver was slated to fly on GT1, um, but uh, when we attempted to test the receiver that fall, it was found that um, it was experiencing power problems. Uh, we tried to troubleshoot those problems in the lab, but the manufacturer suggested it be sent back to them for a checkout and repair. Um, so it was descoped from GT1 and pushed to GT2. Um, so now GT2 is our first attempt at flying a GPS receiver uh, in the GTX series of satellite buses. Um, so there's no uh, specific requirement regarding the positioning accuracy of the receiver. Um, there's no payloads or control systems on the spacecraft that would require um, positioning knowledge to of some uh, degree of accuracy. However, those sorts of subsystems are likely to be included on GT3 and GT4 in the near future. Um, so with GT2, we want to demonstrate that our satellite bus is capable of supporting a GPS receiver module and achieving on-orbit position fixes. And we also want to be able to assess the positioning performance throughout the GT2 mission. Uh, all this information will be very valuable for determining what kind of position enabled capabilities that we might want to include on future missions. So uh, the GPS receiver module that we selected for um, the GT2 mission is a commercial off the shelf component called the Pumpkin GPR, GPS RM-1. Um, it's called a, a receiver module, not just a receiver um, because it contains much more than just the GPS receiver. Uh, the receiver itself is um, is a Novatel space grade uh, GPS receiver, and it's housed underneath that black radiation shielding you see in the picture. Um, so it's not strictly necessary for a receiver to be housed on a supporting module like this, but there's definitely some key advantages uh, to using a COTS receiver module such as the Pumpkin. Uh, first among these are that the pumpkin comes with the receiver that already has its uh, COCOM limits unblocked. Uh, those are limits that are basically placed on receivers 
that force them to shut down if they're traveling past a certain speed and past a certain altitude, uh, just to prevent like use in weapons, um, such as like intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, so unfortunately with, uh, those speed and altitude limits are easily exceeded by an orbiting, orbiting satellite. Uh, so it's necessary to get an unblocked receiver for any receiver that is going to be used on a spacecraft. Um, acquiring a standalone unblocked receiver is kind of a lengthy approval process and pretty easily avoided by just going with a COTS module like this pumpkin. Um, another key advantage of going with the pumpkin is that its receiver module is vibration resistant and electromagnetic shielded. Um, that makes it a reliable makes it reliable for use in the space environment and also gives it an improved signal to noise ratio for acquiring GPS signals. Um, the pumpkin also has a CubeSat compatible form factor and a standardized header pin that allows for easy integration into our GT2 um, CubeSat bus. Uh, and finally, the module includes uh, a very efficient orbit propagator that can be used when GPS signals are unavailable or it can also be strategically combined with shutting off the receiver itself for uh, stretches of time in the interest of power budget savings without the need to sacrifice um, the position knowledge. So uh, we've discussed the receiver module itself. So there's basically uh, two goals for the receiver module's acceptance testing. Um, the first is to ensure that the receiver is compatible with our chosen uh, space grade L1 patch antenna um, by achieving a live sky GPS signal position fix. Um, the second is to ensure that the receiver is capable of achieving a position solution at the target orbit by using the GPS constellation sim simulator uh, to simulate that mission orbit. Um, that orbit is roughly a, an equivalent orbit to the International Space Station uh, because the CubeSat is going to be deployed from the ISS. Um, so thus, uh, I developed static test procedures and dynamic test procedures to accomplish those first and second testing goals, respectively. So uh, the static test of the GPS receiver um, involved one of the pumpkin module's key features, which was its ability to be powered by and communicated with solely through a laptop USB connection. Um, that USB connection also allowed the use of uh, the Novatel Connect software, which basically was a GUI and an interface for um, configuring the receiver, uh, monitoring the status of the position fix as it was happening, and generating ASCII text file uh, data logging that were easy for post-processing and determining how well the position was determined. Um, so the initial plan for this static test was to conduct it inside the lab, inside Dr. Lightsey's lab, um, right next to an open window. So this plan would have involved minimal movement of the receiver and the antenna, and it would have been pretty easy to ensure cleanliness and electrostatic discharge safety practices were upheld um, because nothing would have left the lab. Um, unfortunately, in that test setup, I wasn't able to achieve a position fix using the space grade antenna. Um, this pretty much came down to the fact that the window had a very narrow slice of the sky that was visible to it. And the space grade antenna had a pretty large bandwidth. So uh, the time that it took for the space grade antenna to achieve a position fix was longer than the time that, you know, four sat any given four satellites remained in that small slice of the sky. Um, so the limited, yeah, the limited sky visibility outside the lab made it such that the sufficient number of satellites was never really reached um, in the short amount of time that the um, that it was available. So uh, and based on those factors, I concluded we would need a new test setup. Um, so I developed a, a pretty similar test procedure and um, just that involved uh, the test being outdoors. Um, and with an open sky available to the receiver. Um, because the test was outdoors and it involved uh, two very important pieces of flight hardware, the receiver module and the GPS antenna, um, extreme care was taken to ensure that uh, cleanliness and electrostatic discharge safety measures were maintained. Um, the, text, 
the test took place in the southeast corner of Tech Green. Um, so uh, when the tests commenced, uh, about 15 minutes passed after powering on the receiver and a position fix was achieved. Um, the position fix had a horizontal accuracy of about uh, three meters, um, according to the Novatel Connect software. Um, these numbers were slightly higher, but still on the same order of magnitude as uh, the accuracy that was listed in the pumpkin data sheets. Um, and post-processing of the log receiver data basically confirmed that the measured latitude and longitudes didn't match with our location in Ted Green's southeast corner. Thus, the static test was considered a success. So uh, the dynamic test procedure also used um, a laptop for power and the Novatel Connect software for um, configuring, monitoring the position fix, and logging data. Uh, however, instead of connecting the patch antenna um, to the receiver module, uh, we connected the uh, simulator's signal output directly to the receiver module using a coaxial cable. Um, the dynamic test uh, involves simulating the receiver in the International Space Station's orbit. Um, so thus, it was necessary to reconfigure uh, two of the receiver's default settings. Um, first was the Doppler window. Um, this had to be expanded um, using the ISS orbital speed of about 7.6 kilometers per second. And the Doppler shift equation, um, a suitable Doppler window was found um, that would be able to handle the increased orbital speed um, and thus the increased relative velocity of GPS satellites relative to our receiver. Um, next, the elevation angle cutoff was adjusted. Um, for Earth-based users, the elevation angle cutoff is typically set around 5 to 10 degrees because you want to minimize the number of measurements that are coming in at a shallow angle uh, because those signals are more prone to um, large atmospheric errors. Um, however, for a GPS user in low Earth orbit, um, the GPS satellites below the horizontal are not really a problem, and accepting measurements from more satellites just allows for a quicker signal lock, um, which is important um, because the signal lock takes longer at those higher orbital speeds. Um, so a suitable elevation cutoff angle was found to be about negative 30 degrees. Um, so once the receiver was configured for space use, um, I used the simulator um, to generate a simulation for the receiver in an in International Space Station orbit. Um, I then passed along that simulated data to the simulator hardware, which generated, uh, generated the actual um, radio signals uh, that corresponded to that data and sent it to the receiver. Um, so the initial tests didn't result in a position fix for the GPS receiver module. Um, this wound up being because the simulator was um, simulating uh, signals at GPS transmit power, which is about 27 dBW. Um, the simulator then goes and it models the free space losses uh, as the signal travels uh, down to low Earth orbit. And this results in the receiver getting a signal at a power level of about negative 155 dBW. Um, this is pretty far below the receiver's minimum acceptable input level, uh, thus the position fix was not possible. So um, the receiver needs the gain that its antenna provides in order to detect these low powered signals. Uh, but with the simulator testing configuration, it's not really possible to connect the antenna. Um, so luckily the simulator has a useful feature that um, instead of just simulating the GPS constellation at its default transmit power, you can actually specify the received power level at the location of your simulated receiver. Um, so based on the, uh, the antenna's gain um, and the estimated received power level at low Earth orbit, um, I determined what the received power level could be expected to be um, if the antenna was included, and that was about negative 135 dBW. Um, a second test was then performed with this new power level, um, which was well within the RF input levels of the receiver. And um, after about 13 minutes, the receiver achieved a position fix. Um, 
using the Novatel GUI, it was found that the uh, receivers, um, the receiver saw closely match, oh, whoops, excuse me, the receiver's position closely matched that of the simulated orbit uh, throughout the duration of the simulation. And the polar plot that indicated the GPS satellites that the receiver saw overhead closely matched the polar plot uh, generated for the simulated satellites. Um, so the dynamic test was thus also considered a success. And um, having passed both the static test and the dynamic test, we proved that the receiver could make position fixes both with our chosen flight antenna and at our required mission orbit. So the acceptance testing as a whole was considered a success. Um, so it was very exciting to see the receiver make those position fixes for the first time um, using the simulator and the antenna, especially after all the malfunctions and the repairs that we had to endure during the fall. Um, however, the most interesting work with the receiver is pretty much still ahead of us. Um, the first of these next steps involve uh, the flight software um, for commanding the receiver and also processing its output. Um, in addition to those things, um, there's also gonna be a need to develop software that controls when the receiver can shut off and when the positioning can then be taken over by the orbit propagator. Um, and closely tied to that point, is going to be the need to perform analysis on the power budget of the receiver module and how that can be improved by strategically shutting off the receiver and switching over to the propagator. Um, so later on in the life cycle of the spacecraft, the receiver will need to be integrated into the avionics stack and testing is going to be uh, done to ensure that the receiver is interfacing properly with the flight computer. Um, and uh, a final next step is going to be uh, research um, that is done uh, to find experimental payloads and technologies that can potentially fly on GT3 and GT4 in the future that will put our satellite buses' new positioning capabilities to good use. Um, so with all this interesting work left to do, I'm very excited to continue working with the receiver module in the fall, and I can't wait to see it fly on GT2 in the near future. Um, so. That is all I have. Um, so thanks everyone for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. All right, great. Thank you very much, Paul. That's uh, mm -hmm. that's great. Very comprehensive work. Thank you. Uh, let's see if there are questions. So uh, Paul, why don't you um, update us on what's next for you, though? Uh, so. Um, Let's see, I'll be starting uh, grad school in the fall and continuing on in Dr. Lightsey's lab. Um, so the fall semester is probably going to be finishing up this uh, GT2 work and I'll also be a, a graduate TA, I think. And then starting in the spring, um, I don't really know the details, but I think I'll be on a upcoming um, JPL navigation project that Dr. Lightsey is currently um, working on securing. So that's the right, plan. Right. Okay. All right. Sounds great. All right. Keep up the great work then. And thank you all for joining uh, and take care. Awesome. All right. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Thanks.